Good morning, world changers. We are back for another values led conversation with Alan Williams, the creator of the card game Values Jam and a good friend of Change Your World, Alexandra Wenman. So, just to give you a bit of background about Alexandra, and I warn you for some, this may seem a little out there, but Alexandra is devoted to normalizing the conversation about spirituality and awakening. She brings the out there in here with her down to earth approach and is the go to voice for the cosmically curious. Acting as a cosmic compass, a light bringer, activator, alchemist, channel and seer, Alexandra facilitates deep healing and transformation in her sessions and workshops by connecting you with your higher self and light guides inspiring you to discover your inner magic. She also lovingly guides you to a deeper understanding of who you truly are. Alexandra is also an author, speaker, healer, poet, and presenter, and has become the go-to expert and wise woman in a world that is waking up quicker than ever before. But all that aside, I can tell you that Alexandra is simply and truly the most beautiful soul, and I'm sure that will come out in this Values Jam today, and I'm very intrigued to see where this will lead. So I'll hand over to you guys, enjoy, and I will see you at the end. Enjoy your Values Jam. Thanks, Thanks. Susie. Hi, Alexandra. (laughs) Hi, Alan. Nice to see you. Yeah, and you. I'm so looking forward to seeing what's going to come out of this. <laughs> Me too. It's going to be interesting. <laughs> so, so this is what we're going to play, a values jam. This is the card deck. And in the box, probably you already know what's in the box, right? <laughs> I've had a sneaky peek, yes. <laughs> so we've got an introduction leaflet. And actually, that explains that the game was inspired by the concept of a music jam. So, you know, when musicians come together, they've no idea what's going to happen and they're just curious and playful they don't actually qualify the capability of somebody joining they just let them join in and see where it goes if anybody messes up that's fine nobody stops and has an inquest you know they just carry on and actually sometimes they just build in what has happened into the way the jam develops and when we were thinking about this game we loved all of that stuff uh, and we thought, yeah, that's values jam. That's that's what it should be. So I love it. that's the creative process, isn't it? Sometimes you you get a bit messy. You you have to embrace the chaos to to call in the creation. Dead right, because you know I think sometimes people want to feel as though they're in control and plan things to the nth degree and all of this sort of stuff. But actually, the known for me, represents such a tiny percentage of what is, what's the point of focusing your life on a tiny percentage? Why don't you just jump into the unknown and see what happens? You're on my page, Alan. (laughs) (laughs) Completely. So what we're going to do um, to start with, if it's all right with you, we're just going to go through a very quick selection process to identify a card that we're going to play with. So I'm just going to um, create a number of different piles from the deck of cards. And there are five of these. So would you like one, two, three, four or five? Uh, four, please. Four. OK. And so in pile four, I've got six, nine, ten, twelve cards. So number between one and twelve. Eleven, please, Alan. Oh, my goodness. Oh, beautiful. It couldn't be more timely. Wow, so timely. All right, so the way the game works is this. On the back of the cards, there's a series of six questions. It doesn't matter that you can't read the words, but what you will be able to see is that the first and the last question are both in bold. Mm -hmm. And pretty much the only guideline of the game is that we start with the first question and we finish with the last question. In between times, we might use some, all, a few, none (laughs) of the questions in between, and the order might be pretty random. Uh, So the first question is, what does protection of the environment mean? What does it look, feel, sound like? Wow. 
Well, ordinarily, I would go to protection of our, our earth and our home and our environment in that sense of the word, but I'm being guided to talk about protection of our own environment. And a lot of the, the work I do and, uh, um, is about protecting our own energy, our own energy field, and really getting clear on our own needs, our own desires, what's important for us, as individuals and in my experience when we take care of our own uh, kind of inner sanctum our own body our own space our own health then our outer world becomes a mirror and a reflection of that so a lot of people look out at the world around them and the outer environment and they feel overwhelmed especially when it comes to things like looking after the planet climate change you know wars and conflicts pandemics disruption and that can put them into a state of turmoil and make them feel a little bit out of their depth, a bit overwhelmed. And that can lead to mental health issues and all kinds of things, stress, anxiety. But when we take our focus off the outer environment and we bring our focus back into our hearts and back onto ourselves, and we just take care of what's immediately in front of us, that can have a huge positive knock-on effect in our in our day-to-day -day lives, in our relationships, and in the way that we perceive the greater world around us anyway. And in that way, we are really acting as magicians and alchemists to help heal the, the bigger world around us because it's all a reflection. So that's my that's the the immediate thing that I feel drawn to um, to talk about there is to really take be able to to take care of your own needs, to know that it's not selfish to do that, but to have the um, the self-love to look after your own inner world and your inner environment and and have healthy boundaries around that so that your outer world is a reflection of it yeah i can see that and you know when when we look and project the outside world onto our inner selves and mess it up as a result i can see exactly what you're saying and that you've reminded me of we were in mallorca just last month and we decided to get up at half past five in the morning to go to a high place to see the sunrise. And we got there about half an hour before the sun came up. And while we were waiting and as it was getting lighter, there was a mother goat with its kid that came by and they were just about two meters away from us, you know, kind of not bothered about us being there. And I just remember thinking, this is an amazing moment. And thinking you could forget that there was a pandemic uh, at the moment. And it, it was just away in that moment and feeling really privileged to be able to experience it. Um, however, on the other side of it, I remember seeing a, a program about um, fishing and the way that we factory fish. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, there are these just unimaginably big boats that go out there and just take everything in their way out of the sea. And I remember thinking, why do we allow this actually? Mm -hmm. And so I've got a question I think that's forming for you, which is around, whilst I agree with what you've said about looking after ourselves and then that being able to project onto the world, how does that actually do anything about situations like the one that I've just described? Yeah, you're hundred percent right. I, the word accountability comes to mind for me. And I think um, when you, when you do really deeply look within and go to self inquiry, those are the questions we need to be asking ourselves. You know, it's not coming at it from a, a I put myself first from a greedy perspective or a, you know, it's all about me kind of perspective. It's about seeing ourselves as part of a greater whole, as part of a greater unified field of consciousness and awareness and a greater community and holding ourselves accountable. So, you know, it's like when they talk about things like, um, you know, taking care of your own your own patch you know people doing their recycling doing their little bit to make it count and if everybody did on the whole planet then there would be this huge big effect of change and that doesn't just include individuals that includes businesses because we know that factories are pumping out a lot of stuff as well and they need to be held accountable so i think when um when i talk about self-inquiry the word truth accountability honesty comes up and we we have to move into a time on our planet now where we are 
incredibly honest with ourselves. You know, a lot of people walk around with blinkers on thinking that the way that they behave in the world doesn't impact anybody else, but we are all connected. I see it as this sort of interwoven uh, field of love consciousness and you know we can no longer look at what's happening on the other side of the world and think that doesn't impact me or that's not my problem because we it's like a ripple effect the butterfly effect you know it's it we're we're all part of the problem and we're all part of the solution so i think that um yes you're 100 percent right i mean i always laugh because in 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 this world that we find ourselves in it's a world of duality right we have light dark good bad right wrong and the way i see um all healing and all protection and all things happening is when we bring those polarities together into a field of unconditional love we let go of judgment and then we can find the best possible solution forward we go right what's going to benefit everybody so you know if i'm um you know, it's one thing to be in a state of oh, self-protection where you shut everybody else out, but that's not going to work. So how can I take care of myself? But then once I'm feeling secure and centered in myself, how can I bring the best version of myself out into the world? And what can I do to help? How can I be out in the wider community? Maybe what are my gifts? What are my skills? Because some people are real introverts they don't do very well going out and you know doing things like picketing and whatnot but they can do their own part from home you know writing letters or whatever it is that they need to do um but the idea of um maybe instead of coming at things from a negative perspective or a doom and gloom perspective because that can also again feel overwhelming is to come at it from a place of excitement you know what can we do to rally people what can we do to to bring new solutions to the forefront and and flip our perspective up a little bit and look at the the hopeful things that are going on on the planet and the people that are affecting great change as well and how can we get involved and i think that that is a um more of a way to inspire people to get involved in how they can help rather than thinking oh god we're climbing this huge mountain we're never going to be able to help and 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 feeling like they can't make a difference yeah and i, I think the there's a few things that you've said there that resonate really strongly with me the first one is this thing about we're all connected and so many, it seems that so many people make decisions based on themselves or their small group rather than thinking about how we are all connected. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing, I, I love what you're talking about in terms of balancing the messaging that's going out there because you know, great things do happen in the world. And yet, how often do we hear about those great things? You know, the media seems to be obsessed with showcasing bad news yes. <laughs> for, what, for whatever reason. And, you know, at best, it is undoubtedly imbalanced. Mm. And at worst, there's something sinister going on for, for that to be happening. Um, and in terms of inspiration, I, 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 this is a bit of a random thought, but I, I've started to learn with these values jams that if something comes into your head, then just share it. <laughs> so when I was uh, young, I didn't. I came from a, a not a particularly wealthy background. We didn't have holidays and stuff like that. So we used to have day trips um, sometimes during the summer. And I loved animals. So, and I've still got a book somewhere here, actually. I must go and have a look at that. Uh, so it was the first book that I got about animals when I was about seven years old. And so my mum took me to the nearest zoo. And now I know that a lot of zoos are not really the best place for animals, but it was my first experience of seeing animals in, you know, for real. And one of the ways in which I think we might actually inspire ourselves for uh, protecting our environment is to be thinking about the joy of our grandchildren being able to see these wonderful animals because if we choose a different path they're not going to be able to do that i love that that's so gorgeous yeah i i grew up in a small town in country new south wales in australia on the beach by the sea and was surrounded by nature and trees and animals galore and you know i now live in the middle of london <laughs> and you know it, it nature is so important to me and getting out in nature is so important to me 
And um, I do think that, you know, I think for future generations, we need to preserve this beautiful planet that we have and we need to educate really education i think is really really key educating kids and like you said taking kids out showing them nature getting them involved in things like forest schools and things like that and teaching them accountability when they're young is a really great way to make a start um but i think we need to re-educate adults i think we need to get adults to reconnect with their inner child to to help them remember what it's like to be a child and that innocence of exploring you know some of the things I do with my clients is to get them to look at things from a, a different perspective or imagine they're looking at the world through the eyes of a child. And we can do that with each other as well. I think in terms of like our, our humanity, I mean, we talk about, yeah, there could be something more sinister going on behind the scenes in the media and things like that. So the other thing I do is I, I try to look at every human being as though they are a child and I try to see the child within them and that can help you to kind of see through their their kind of outer patterns and their outer behaviors to help you let go of the judgment and remember that every human being has an innocent child an innocent divine child within them and when we can see the divinity within every single human being and we can drop the judgment we can more easily shift into a place of forgiveness and love and it and it makes it a lot easier and and you will you, you do get tested on this i've just been through a huge um court case where i was really tested on this the forgiveness for the other person um and holding that person in love regardless of how they were behaving. It's tough. It is a, it is an initiation, but I think that the more of us can do this, what you actually get, and you might not think you're making a difference by doing it, but I'm kind of very um, familiar with how energy works. And the more, again, that we can focus on the positive and the, and bring that, that love perspective in the more we're actually helping to melt and dissolve the walls around the hearts in these people. There's yeah. a, a really powerful Hawaiian um, shamanic prayer called the Ho'oponopono. And I don't know if you know it. Um, it's four key phrases and it's very, very simple. And what you do is you say these four phrases, really you're saying them to yourself for what you're experiencing. So the reflection. So if somebody's behaving badly or if you don't like something you're seeing on the news or you don't agree with something, you're, you're calling up the emotions and the way that it makes you feel. And you're saying to yourself, I'm sorry is the first phrase i'm sorry i'm sorry you're having to witness this i'm sorry you're having to go through this i'm sorry you're having to experience this please forgive me so we then acknowledge that in the whole soup of consciousness we're part of it we wouldn't be witnessing it if we if we weren't part of it so please forgive me for any part i've had to play in it whether you know what that is or not i love you the reminder that that we are all love that that everything is love and that you are loved so that you're, you're allowed to feel safe. And thank you. Thank you for the lesson. Thank you for the blessing. Thank you for opening my eyes. Thank you for helping me to see beyond the, uh, the illusion of negativity and find the, the hidden blessings in it. And, you know, you can direct it at the other person and at the situation as well, but it's way more powerful if you hold it towards yourself and you really hold yourself in that tender love and it is so powerful there have been studies done on this prayer you know there have been like psychiatrists working in prisons who've actually made massive changes to the to the psychologic the psychology of the the prisoners um, in these places because of this prayer and it's so simple and i think that if we if we come at it from everything is a reflection that we have such power to make huge changes on this planet energetically emotionally through our perception and then through our action so it, it's it's all the spectrum isn't it it's not just doing it's also feeling it's also thinking it's also trusting um and i think that it, it i see it like a a multifaceted approach i think we always need a, a holistic approach to everything because every situation is always different uh, it's a bit like this pandemic, really. We can't have one Band-Aid solution for everyone. I don't believe that at all. We're all unique. We're all individual. And what what is one person's um, tonic could be another person's toxin. So we have to really listen to each other as human beings. We need to have open conversation and dialogue. And, you know, 
even as you know because i'm an extreme empath so i have compassion for everyone i feel everything but the minute we go into the blame game as well we're no better than the people that are perhaps misbehaving so we have to kind of meet on a certain level and that doesn't mean we're saying that behavior is okay or what you're doing is okay sometimes we have to stand up for truth and say no to things but i think that uh, listening open dialogue and listening to ourselves as to what we're learning is a, a a good key way to sort of start to open things up a bit more wow you've there is so much in what you've just said and i'm just trying to pick through it um to re, to respond to some of them so the first the first thing that struck me was this whole thing about the child in us and i can't really describe what i'm thinking here but it's like you have the child and then as we grow older you have these kind of shells is actually coming into my mind layers of shell upon layers of shell upon layers of shell that form and they kind of they're designed maybe to protect or whatever it is i'm not so sure but actually i think they have the opposite impact and they mask and hide yeah. so that the inner child is not heard or seen and that's to our det detriment mm. and if only we could peel back those layers um, i'm just wondering actually imagine if we had a uh, imagine if we had a world government of children imagine the conversations that they would have and i can i can imagine them saying things like well if what we're doing is going to cause the extinction of these species that's you know there's no way that we should be allowed we that. better stop right <laughs> yeah, we stop. Yeah. and then somebody would say you know those factory ships that just take everything out of the sea just stop them just don't allow them anymore just put a maximum size and the, I, I'm, I'm sure i'm being very very naive here but that's how children think and yet that's the beauty and the simplicity of it often they cut through all of the crap that we get preoccupied with and they just get right to the source of the issue identify it and that's the solution yeah. and if, if only we could think a bit more like that in some way um so that's about one thing and then um can i just say i think that um the world is being run by a group of children <laughs> but a group of children that were never listened to perhaps as children oh, what a brilliant put, point, through, yeah. put through you know education systems that you know kind of taught them how to i don't know maybe be shut down and put up those walls and yeah and i think that there's a lot of inner child wounding that's running the show at the moment unfortunately great point great point and then you talked about how it's a multifaceted approach. And I, I agree with that. Although what you made me think of is that perhaps we're missing a fundamental relationship between the two because, or the many, because we tend to focus very much on action. Mm. And yet action without mindset slash emotion is not rooted in anything and probably is not going to be very successful. So it strikes me that rather than focus on what we need to do, it would be better to focus on how we feel about what we can either create or destroy and really bang on about the feelings and the emotions because then the actions will come. Yeah. Whereas if we're just shoving actions down people's throats and they're feeling incapable, then what good is that going to do really? Um, we're looking at it again. It's the same thing, isn't it? It's at this band-aid approach yeah. of new rules, new laws, new things. And we're being, you know, if we look at our society, we've got more rules and laws than ever that are trying to tighten the reins on everything and corral yeah. everyone in and box everyone in. And actually it's just putting more shells around it and yeah. hiding the core damage yeah. that's in there on, on our collective psyche. Yeah. And you, your reference to the Hawaii um, piece, there is so much indigenous wisdom that we have not been able to explain perhaps over the years, but increasingly we are starting to make the relationship between some of their practices and ways and our 
new science and we're starting to understand that there's more to it than we might previously have thought and again that comes back to what you were just saying about new laws regulations all that sort of stuff uh, i recently i i've started to become interested in uh, zulu tradition and uh, there is something that i came across recently and actually we talked about this in a recent uh, values jam about justice mm. and um if somebody does something wrong in a tribe what happens is that the elders i don't know whether you've come across this maybe you have i have but say it because i think it's really beautiful and really important okay so that the elders form a circle around the the person and if i make mistakes about this do do come in and tell me the, the real version and that they they tell them stories about when they've been a good person mm. and when we were talking about this and justice, we kind of came to the conclusion that justice in itself might be fundamentally flawed mm. because actually all it does is meet us out a punishment and that's all. Whereas in this Zulu situation, the individual is really able to understand that they are more light than they are dark um, that this was a choice that they made for whatever reason, and they can reflect on whether that was the best thing to do or not. And it just seems in spirit that there's far greater opportunity for them to realize that they can and should and will make a different choice next time. Mm. And that might be over romanticized for some, but it just feels much better than this kind of hard harsh justice approach i agree it's beautiful and it you know again it's in the perception it helps that person to see the good in themselves which is so yeah. healing and so beautiful and their their own capabilities i think that there's a lot to be said for encouraging people's capabilities i talking about you know indigenous wisdom and and politics and all of that i when i I've never really been interested in politics and I used to always just be like, oh, that, I don't get that, that doesn't interest me. But I realized fairly recently that it was because there is no politics on this planet that actually suits my, um, my way of experiencing the world or wanting to experience the world. But I started looking at the indigenous and I also look at how, because I work with a lot of um, guides and guide teams and, and uh, collective consciousness groups in terms of spirit light beings and when they come through with messages they work as a collective they will often deliver it their voices like a almost like a chorus of voices at a at a higher dimensional level so they come in on this frequency of love and they all speak together and occasionally an individual spirit or guide will step forward but if we're talking about say ascended masters one will come forward but they all move together as one group a cohesive group and i was thinking about this and i was thinking we need systems of government and politics on this planet that work in circles rather than hierarchies where you have a bit like the indigenous maybe where you have representatives from the children the elders the women the men the teenagers every facet of society represented and forming a circle and then they put things to a vote so that everyone's needs are met and then they have those other circles where the women you know have their own circle the men have their own circle and then you have this beautiful flower of life pattern of beautiful um harmonized cooperative making sure that everybody is heard. I think listening is such a powerful tool and we don't do enough of it. And how often in, um, you know, conversation, I love this conversation because it's so beautiful. I love that we're bouncing off each other because how often in conversation do you see people kind of not really listening, but yeah. more trying to think about, oh, oh, what can I say next? You know, it's like, so I think there's so much merit in it. And these topics as well, I think we need more conversations in a, in a public domain with topics like this, Alan. I love what you're doing. Thank you. And, uh, you know, that that's, that's, was the inspiration because what we see in the world is so much polarisation. And what happens is that people feel that they have to defend their position. And so they're not listening to the other people. They're just really 
ramming home their message and entrenching. And that is just so unhealthy. And what this game does actually is that it, in a gentle way, it forces you to be more listening than contributing. And then you start to understand the other person better. And then you start to question your own position. And then you start to realize that actually it's not your position. It doesn't need to be your position. It's just a position, right? And so it just helps you get to a far more mature, joined up view at, at the end of the day. Um, something, uh, this is a bit random, but just now you talked about we're all part of it. And I heard a story um, a while ago that I really enjoy. I hope you will too. It's about a guy who's on his way to a meeting and he gets stuck in a traffic jam. And so he telephones his boss and says, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to be late I'm, uh, for the meeting. And I uh, just wanted to ring, let you know, uh, sorry about that. And his boss just said to him, can I remind you of one thing? And he said, what? And the boss said, uh, you are part of the traffic jam. <laughs> <laughs> I love That's a good boss. He gets it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and the, when I first... It's like, damn that, this traffic jam. But actually, yeah, yeah you're in it. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, um, the Band-Aid piece, that's the other thing that... Uh, struck me is that you know with the pandemic i think what well and I, I'm, I'm not really qualified to have this view i suppose um but it seems to me that what was needed or is still needed actually is a whole world strategy rather than independent nation strategies mm -hmm. because if we've got a um planetary emergency how can you deal with that if you're going to deal with it in bits? And I saw some stats the other day about the level of vaccination in Africa, for instance, and it's horrendous. You know, how can you expect us to cope with this on behalf of humanity if we're picking and choosing who's going to be OK and who's not? Um, and I, I don't know who, who that would be. Maybe it's the, the World Health Organization or some body of some sort. And I was thinking, you know, how, how would it have been when this happened if we were able to, governments were forced to hand over power to this world body that was responsible for handling emergencies of any sort? And how much more effective that could have been if, for instance, you were to bring together all of the, let's say, logistical and military experience in the world in one place to deal with what effectively is an emergency situation, instead of being handled by people who are really media managers. You know, politicians are focused more on media management than they are in handling crises. I'm going to play devil's advocate here, though. <laughs> Go on. <clears throat> Because in order to hand over that much power to one body, you have to be really sure that that one body is in integrity. Yeah, for and sure. That puts the fear of God into me, actually, what you just said. I'm on the other side of the page. I think, um, I think we have to be really careful. There needs to, it's a, it's a tricky, tricky time on the planet right now because we're dealing with a pandemic and obviously there's a lot of danger in the, 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 the illness itself. But we're also now dealing with the question of people's individual freedoms being encroached on. And there's a, and this is where I say, you know, the duality, the polarity is how do we bring that together and, and find a solution? Um, because I think there's a heck of a lot of corruption in some of these bodies as well. And that, that actually makes me think, no, don't give them all the power to put it in one place. Um, I don't know. I'm not a conspiritualist. Um, I'd like to take a centralized, very balanced view of it all. But I think that, and, and I've had experience of this too, when I've had like, maybe I've had a, a strong view on one point, when I look at the opposing view, because I always like, I'm a Libra, so I have to look at both sides of the coin and there's always two sides to every coin. I always think, right, look at this side of the coin. 
which which one am I kind of erring towards? Now bring in the other one yeah. and see if you can find the merit in the other one. Bring the two together. And in bringing the two together, there has to be a third way. There's got yeah. to be a solution again that fits all. And it takes a heck of a lot of trust and faith to find that solution. And sometimes until it reveals itself, you said it at the beginning, we have to sit in the unknown. We have to get comfortable in, I don't know what the solution is. So we hand over to a higher power or we hand over to our higher mind or we sit back and trust because until we know, we don't know. And that's when the, the proverbial question mark comes in. And I, you know, I, I do a lot of really following my intuition and my guidance and with any decision I have to make in my life, if I don't know, then I don't act. And I, and I wait and there's merit also in waiting till that solution comes about, you know, until exactly. say maybe scientists are working on a, a new therapy or remedy that might come out in the near future. So my feeling is we don't need to push and rush. And again, you know, like you said, lay, lay a more action on top. It's like, what if we all just kind of sat back a bit, did common sense, took precautions, but actually, it trusted the process and allowed it to unfold rather than trying to force our way through it. Um, it comes back, I think, to what we were saying earlier about how the, the only reason we, we feel that we need to force the actions through is because people are not starting from the right emotional or spiritual place. So yeah. th this whole thing around um, mask wearing and social distancing, it's like, for me, that's just common sense, right? If, if the world has changed and there's this invisible thing out there that you can catch from people by being close to them, then if everybody just maintained some social distance and wore a mask, yeah. that would have a major impact without being told that you had to do it. But also then go uh, along with that, educate people around fear and and not to go into fear and to stay in trust and to stay in faith yeah. and to because if you know uh, anything about the law of attraction fear begets fear begets fear begets fear begets fear and then you're creating more panic when and when you create panic and anxiety and stress solutions don't appear we block it so as a collective i think they need to be doing more to do with mental health on this situation more to do with bringing in mindfulness practice you know along with the mask maybe they should have like rolled out a meditation campaign on national television you know they could have been using the news for a positive um campaign to support people in this instead suicide rates have gone through the roof domestic yeah. violence has gone through the roof and people haven't been being taken care of and the poor key health workers and we forget the supermarket workers the supermarket yeah. workers are on the front line there's no support for them so i think we need more of a system where people are emotionally supported and, you know, we come from a society that's so entrenched in logic that it's forgotten. It's forgotten feminine wisdom. It's forgotten women's wisdom. It's forgotten that we all have a feminine side and an intuitive side and an emotional side. And our inner child is not being taken care of in this global pandemic. So I think we need to be bridging it now. They need to be taking care of people's emotions. They need to be listening about what people need on an individual level as well as, like you say, the common sense and bringing in the actions that are going to help to smooth the way out of this. Mm. And there, there's also a question mark around our base instincts, I guess, because I understand what you're saying about the, the whole fear slant of messaging. And I, when I mentioned uh, mask wearing and social distancing, I was thinking, you know, my mindset is that I am an ambassador of protecting my environment by doing yeah, it. Right? Yeah, so it comes it's, back to it, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, whereas it's very easy to say that, I guess. But if people are scared for their lives, then they will naturally be thinking of themselves first and their family members first. Mm. And I think it, it equally, it's kind of... Um, arrogant and disrespectful not to appreciate that you know that that's something that you can understand people thinking yeah. but that, for me I'm a, I'm a great believer in and rather than or and so it's okay to feel that you need to protect yourself but at the same time 
equally you can be protecting others and if the message was like that then that would be a whole lot more easy for people to accept and if you look at eastern cultures for instance they have no problem wearing a mask they've been doing it you know since before this situation and it's because they consider themselves more so to be connected and just part of a community than and i know it's a gross generalization than we do in the west where we tend to think of me first for for whatever reason yeah it's a different mindset altogether isn't it mm. Mm. and there's um you've also reminded me there's a campaign in the uk at the moment i think it's uh personal what they're doing is encouraging kids to go out and play and get dirty and you know all of that stuff and where they're coming from is that unless people appreciate the planet for what it gives us in the first place they're not going to be interested to protect it yeah. and it comes back to this thing that we were talking about earlier about if you capture the emotion and the mindset then the actions will flow rather than us starting with the actions and then spending so much energy trying to convince people and without success yeah and 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 kids going out getting dirty boosts their immune system too so there's protecting their environment in the future isn't it yeah absolutely they're 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 biological yeah environment <laughs> now i'm i'm conscious that we we we've had a brilliant conversation we're, we've just done question one i mean we've we oh my have... God, we've only just scratched the surface alan <laughs> <laughs> one question let's, ju uh, let's choose an i tell you what let's let's have uh, let's play with this okay. one of the four questions is and i'd like you to have a go at this if you wouldn't mind ask your own question about protection of the environment beginning with who what where when why or how Oh, who, what, when, where, why, or how? Yeah. <clears throat> Mine is probably how, and in terms of the planet, and it's a question that I tend to ask quite a lot, and I ask it usually of the angels because it's my thing, I'm like, how are we going to sort this out? <laughs> How are we going to sort this out? How are we going to, as a humanity, as a collective, come together mm. and really sort this out quickly? You know, really, really, how are we going to do this? And, and that, is, that is a question mark because I don't have the solution for that. And that, that's a question I think that needs to be put to every single human being who's chosen to live on this planet at this time how are we how are we together going to sort out this planet and and protect her and and sort out our sort out our collective you know sort out who we are and, and come together how are we going to do that you know so alexandra you don't do small questions then right no no <laughs> i mean i do i think about the bigger picture all the time at the moment you can see i've got this this little um mother earth statue behind me this is our planet and i'm actually running a program with 22 women at the moment called the world angel program and some of the work i do is as a world healer so i do zoom out and look at the bigger picture a lot of the time and um yeah that's a question i do think of a lot of the time but i think a lot of us need to you know i said at the beginning you know look at yourself as an individual but i think we need to be doing both look at the whole picture and our place in it at the same time yeah and you know so i i went to see my youngest daughter in sterling in scotland a few um probably a month ago now and um her flat overlooks uh, sterling castle and there's a monument and that's where the sun rises and i woke up early and was able to, to there's a thing about sunrises going on here isn't there anyway I, I found myself writing a poem about about it oh you write poetry too amazing well no <laughs> I, I suppose you write well, lyrics <laughs> this is another conversation but i i, I created um, a global poetry showcase this year and we invited people to submit poems from communities all around the world and we received um, submissions from 
Australia, Africa, US, Canada, India, Europe, uh, Albania, uh, which I think probably is in Europe. And it was, it's just been fantastic. What we're wanting to do is make poetry accessible because too many people think of poetry as being this kind of untouchable, you know, posh people stuff. Um, but anyway, that, that's an aside. The, the, the poem that I wrote, I found myself explaining that in order for us to be successful in protecting the planet, we had to be doing it not for us. Mm -hmm. We had to be doing it for the planet. And in answer to your question, this might be a cop out because it, it's a short answer rather than a very complicated one. But I have a sense actually that at the root of it is that if we put the planet at the center mm -hmm. of everything that we're deciding, that will help us make the right choices. So going back to that example about the factory ships, if we're putting the planet at the center of our decision making, we would stop that. Mm -hmm. And then we would just have to manage the consequences that, you know, it's like, that's just a given. Um, so that, that's my oversimplistic answer. What about, what about your thoughts? I have to agree. I have to 100% agree because without a planet, there's no us. Well, that's it. Is that, and that's simple. It's without her, we ain't got no place to live. You know, I know they're building rocket ships and things right now, but probably only with enough seating for about 10 people. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there is no planet B. And then uh, the other, the other dimension to that, and I, I, I know you push back on this and I understand exactly why. And I have many of the same reservations as you in the kind of, cold light of day but if i allow my idealistic mind to, to take this forward um imagine that trusted government of the world mm. that is able to bring all parties together and make choices for the good of the planet oh, yeah i mean i can see it in the future i mean can you imagine i think that <clears throat> an amazing future would be like we were talking about that if it was a one government but where all factions of society yeah. were included yeah. and then i think there would be no need to have any borders to have separate countries you know i think i see in the future at some point that we are allowed to be nomadic again you know like the tribes that we can you know just be where our heart takes us and make sure that everyone is working in a harmonized flow but there's a lot of work to do on the psychology before then but I think that's part of the pandemic I think it's happening really rapidly we're all starting to realize we are part of a a, a bigger collective and it, so here's a wow you just made me think um you, you're talking about not needing borders I remember many years ago thinking I wonder if ever there will be a day when we won't have an Olympic Games where people represent their countries but actually they represent their corporations because corporations, many corporations are more wealthy than many countries, right? Yeah. So could you imagine the top, I don't know, 50, maybe less corporations in the world coming together to form a world council, a world corporate council for the good of the planet mm. and having a budget and a fund to do good stuff. In Wouldn't that be amazing if they put their money to something like that? Wouldn't that just be incredible? Mm. I think we need to manifest that, Alan. <laughs> 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 I think we need to focus our love attention on their inner child to help open their hearts so that they will come to something like that of their own accord to help them to support them to do that mm. and i think I, I i love to think in terms of legacy as a powerful motivator um let me give you a really tiny example to demonstrate um this but imagine those ceos of those top 25 50 companies being able to say i was part of this new world council that saved the world in some way you know what a, what a brilliant thing for their children and their grandchildren and thereafter to be able to say about them uh, so i i did some work 
uh, started last year with a school in um, Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, it, it originated because uh, there was a teacher there that wanted to do a values-based leadership, leadership session for uh, the senior students, you know, 16 to 18 year old. And so we had a mutual acquaintance. I agreed that I would do this one hour session, had the pre-call with the teacher. And during the conversation, I said, uh, does the school have a set of values? And she said, no. So I said, oh, well, what, how would you feel about if they did, if you, your school had a set of values? And she said, well, that would be amazing, but who would do that? So then I said, well, what about if I provided the students with some guidance and the structure and the process, but they did it. And then when they leave next spring, their legacy to the school is that you have your set of values that will stand you in good stead for many years to come. And that, that's what happened. And I tell you, the, these guys were so impressive in the work that they did. And they were so thrilled in the role that they played in the life, the future life of that school, rather than leaving like a bench or something like that, right? So I think there might well be something about this world corporate leaders coming together to leave their legacy for the planet at this time. So you need to roll this out within companies now, don't you? You need to really have uh, like a values program I'm getting all my goosebumps that you can then bring into all the systems education medicine government corporations um, the legal system the military the police this needs to go into every situation to everyone to sit and think of them I see it almost like a um, a program and you just insert it in and then they filter it into their their um, mission statement. I think you can do this, Alan. No small task. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think I understand what you're saying. I, I, for, for this conversation, because it's about protection of the environment, I, for me, that's where it should be focused. So, yes, it would have a values foundation, but it has to have that focus of protection of the environment. Otherwise, well, yeah. it get lost. if you look at systems their environments corporations yep. yeah, are yeah. environments right yep. and then if they're all if they're all coming back to what are our values time and time again it means that that wheel keeps turning and yep. that they never move away from their values you yep. know they're always accountability again so they keep coming back to that core wow principle. now i'm conscious that susie's going to be thinking oh we're nearly out of time <laughs> And we've got, we have got one question that we need to ask. And so maybe it can be a short-ish answer. <laughs> yeah, rein <write> me in. <laughs> what, what are you encouraged to do differently about protection of the environment as a result of our conversation? Yeah, uh, I think it's coming back again to me about um, letting go of judgment and really just because I know how I operate and how I work in the world, letting go of judgment and just trying to be more open and receptive to ways that I can be a little bit more active, but from that place of listening and opening and solution based uh, in terms of my work. I mean, at the moment I've taken a, a bit of a step back from seeing one-on-one -on -one clients because my work is changing and I don't know what that looks like, but I think you've just dropped in a real, seed of wisdom here for me to go and look at how my business is going to go forward in the future and how I can potentially reach more people in less time with more, more of a, um, a, 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 a message, more of a valuable message rather than working one-on-one. -on -one. I'm looking at taking it out into bigger groups okay. and, um, and more active as well, more, more kind of boots on the ground I do a lot of work that is spiritual, energetic behind the scenes, but I think there's merit in going out and actually being much more vocal, much more visible and much more active in the community as well. Hmm. I, I understand what you're saying. I, I would caution you not to go too much into the action because of what we were saying earlier about how... No, my, yeah, any action I take is always starts from the root of right. the energetic, you know, right. it's not, it's never overlooked. Okay. And mine, I think what you've 
made me realize is that environment is everything mm. so you know it, there's a tendency to think about this card as protection of the environment meaning the planet but actually my environment is my home my family and friends my work relationships so i'm going to be mo much more mindful about the relationship between environment at a micro level and environment at a macro level and how they're all connected so thank you so much for that yeah you well this conversation's really made me me, me realize that too you know you kind of just you do you think of environment as just being the planet or you know but it is it's it's your energy field it's your biology it's your your community it's your relationships it's it's all of it isn't it it is let's get susie back here she is hey susie hey guys oh i just absolutely loved your values jam i was sitting here just wanting to jump in and go oh I, there's so much i wanted to say i think we, we put the world to rights i think, <laughs> I think <so. laughs> the whole world <laughs> i mean essentially that is the whole premise of what change your world is about because it's about developing yourself so that you think and feel better to make better choices and when you make better choices you get better results and that creates a ripple effect so you become a better parent a better leader a better colleague a better simple and you make better choices and that in turn you know changes the world in the process and the organically and when you were sort of saying you know individually it feels like we're not doing that but I mean, we've got 7 billion, 8 billion people on the planet and collectively our choices are making a difference every day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I remember reading this quote about, you know, for every pound we spend, we are voting for the future we want. So where you spend your money absolutely determines the future. So, you know, if you're like Alan, you said about the fishing industry, you know, <laughs> First of all, watch Sea Spiracy on Netflix. That yeah. will change. Honestly, it's just, yeah, that will change your whole mindset. And it's just like, well, where are we spending our money? What choices can we make in our day to day actions? And given our world is driven on business, you know, if we are voting with our money, we are changing the dynamics of what businesses will come forward in the future. And one of the things that I was saying, you know, one of the things I would love for the world to do, like, or for the, our government to do, is that when somebody registers or wants to set up a new business, the question will that they have to answer before it's allowed to go ahead is how does this serve positively serve humanity and the planet? Yes. And well, if it doesn't, everyone you know then why are we setting it up why are we allowing it to happen because if it's just all about making money which is one of the concepts i problems i had when i first started change your world i used to go to all these networking uh, things and the first question i was asked is what is your business and how do you make money yeah and i said no 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 let's ask this different question ask what is my business and how does it help people how does it serve the environment how does it make a difference what's the legacy what's the ripple effect and i could see them just going, <laughs> rolling their eyes but i was just like well you know what is this all for what is the point so absolute excellent uh value channel again i've written tons of notes that i would <laughs> love to share i mean one of the other thing of were you saying alexandra about the inner wounded child you know that is something that you know we've both sorry i've got a message here uh that we've both spoke about privately off camera is about the inner wounded child can often lead to narcissistic behavior and narcissistic behavior becomes well it's all about me and you don't care about anybody else collectively because it's all about your own needs that are not being met so i i feel that we have definitely had our world being run by wounded children narcissists that are not looking at the collective good so we need our empaths we need our people that do care about the planet to start stepping up and that comes first with your own self-development getting your own environment right so then that you can then start changing the world and see the power that you have individually 
and collectively as well and just people we do as individuals underestimate our own potential and our own power and we've got we can make a difference every action choice thought that we we have that's led me on to another thought that i had <laughs> i'll quickly tell you this before we wrap up but i remember watching um drowning in plastic it's a bbc documentary and it is truly heartbreaking it's just literally going around the world and just seeing there's just no part on our planet that isn't polluted by plastic and it got me thinking i was watching it and i had this just kind of this notion i don't know whether it's a divine download but i was just like this is just a reflection of our minds our mm -hmm. minds are polluted and I know this in my own environment, when I'm overwhelmed, I'm stressed, I'm busy, there's a lot going on. I can see it on my desk around me. My desk becomes cluttered and polluted. And I thought collectively, if we're all like that, we are, our thoughts are manifesting and polluting our planet. And that is just a reflection of the inner turmoil that is going on, you know? And so again, like you said, Alexandra, very much getting it back to your own environment and changing, uh, working on yourself, developing yourself so that you get your own environment right. And then you have the capacity to help others make a difference and the ripple effect, which is what Change Your World is all about. And the collaborations that we're talking about here, I think it's just a beautiful collaboration between the three of us about what's being created today, you know, and the message that's going to be put out there. So, yeah, massive thank you to you both. Oh, thank you to both of you. Thank you for having me, Susie. And thank you, Alan, for creating this amazing card game. It's just brilliant. I love it. Absolutely. Well, it is now over to the world changers because of a course it is now for you to reflect on. Put this question into your journals. Think about it. You know what? Uh, let me remind myself it was protection of the environment was the value today. So, you know, what does that feel like, look like, sound like to you? And what can you do uh, as a result, you know, what has this conversation inspired you to do as a uh, encourage you to do differently today that will help the protection of the environment, whether it's your own immediate environment or on a greater scale. So thank you again. Love to hear your viewpoints and share in the comments below. And uh, yeah, love to you all. Take care, guys. Thanks very much. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.